I have decided to conduct a special military operation. We must strive to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine. I don't want to send this message to my dad yet. If I don't make it, please tell him that I love him very much. Don't panic, we are strong. We are ready for anything. We will be victorious. We are Ukraine. Glory to Ukraine. Russia has launched a major offensive against Ukraine. The Russian invasion of Ukraine is the first war to be fought in real time in the media. And not only on television, but most importantly, on social media. To Russia, to victory, to the president. An online propaganda battle is raging. From day one, it's been a contest between truth and lies, information and disinformation. Many political observers also refer to this war as the TikTok war. In Russia, communication is typically one way, top down. Glory to Ukraine. In Ukraine, on the other hand, there are many voices reporting on the war. Glory to Ukraine. It's an extremely massive like, phenomena. It's very grassroots. Everyone, everyone in the country participates in this war. Just like Strategic communication from spin doctors on both sides is carefully orchestrated. Remember that the initial shock will pass. As strange as it sounds, we'll get used to this. We see right through you. Do you understand me, Schultz? Everybody knows that everybody lies. At the outset of the war, Volodymyr Zelensky brought in additional support for his communications team. Oleksiy Arestovich became the president's military advisor. <laughs> The initial shock is always scary. Then come the victories, and there will be more, don't worry. We'll defeat them on the battlefield and the West will finish them off economically. Like the entire Zelensky team, Arestovich doubles as an influencer. He reaches millions of people in Ukraine on social media platforms such as YouTube. In the first days of the war, he was omnipresent. In countless interviews and briefings, he explained what was happening and helped people digest the shock. Bastards. This won't be the war you expected. So basically he's doing the, the job uh, of, a, of a psychotherapist uh, who will tell you what is actually what exactly is happening to you. To normalize this situation, to, to make you take it under your control. Uh, and that's really important, of course, for the traumatized audience, and he's talking to the traumatized audience. So he's not trying to, 
to make it more traumatic to the audience, whereas the Russian military speakers, of course, they're traumatizing the audience with, uh, with all the discourse. Just like anyone in Zelensky's office, Aristovich is wearing the same type of clothes. So for many different audiences, and he, of course, acquired audiences all over the world because he is communicating and mediating the message from the office of the president of Ukraine. So, of course, uh, it's quite unusual to see a governmental official who is wearing this sort of clothes. I'm going to ask you a paradoxical question. Are these the best days of your life? It's really cool. You know, this is going to sound very pompous, and I won't say that war is my thing, but shocks like this are my thing. Major psychological upheavals, because I've been practicing psychology for years. Now they call me the nation's psychotherapist. Soon Aristovich's popularity became apparent to the rest of the world, landing him more and more international interviews. Yes, I can understand that you need military equipment to defend yourselves. But will that really help, given that Ukrainian soldiers might not be trained on that equipment and might even run into difficulties in a combat situation? Ich kenne unsere Armee, ich bin selbst ein Soldat und drei Tage werden wir die beherrschen. Geben Sie uns und dann weiter werden wir schon sehen. Glory to Ukraine. Glory to Ukraine. See you soon. This morning, Russia launched a special military operation to protect the People's Republics of Donetsk and Luhansk. All your friends say your main problem is that you studied law. You love the law and always follow it. It's impossible to make Putin violate the law. That's true. I had very good teachers. Vladimir Solovyov is Putin's chief propagandist. With live casts on his homepage, TV talk shows and his Telegram channel with well over a million followers, he's the Kremlin's ever-present mouthpiece. Schultz has become cocky. He declared that we will help Ukraine with money and equipment until Putin realizes his fatal mistake. Berlin is unprotected. Even back then, in the last war, our aircraft were able to reach Berlin. We can do a lot of things. Germans, you should learn from history. We'll continue after the commercial break. One thing uh, I really like about these shows is that you don't need to speak Russian, you don't need to understand a word in Russian to see how it works. So he's in the center and he will never move from the center. He will normally never approach his guests, he will always stay in the center and the guests are supposed to support his main message from the sidelines. So the narrator, of course, here symbolizes the ruler who delivers uh, the, the real message. And Solovyov, in this excerpt, he basically repeats what Putin was saying uh, in the morning of, of that same day. Now, let's look at Solovyov himself. Here's this famous quote that uh, refers to some uh, mighty rulers of the 30s, uh, probably to Stalin or maybe to, to Mussolini. He always has his hands behind his back. He immediately prepares to attack you. He is aggressive already in this, in this posture. He's never open to you. He is closed and he is aggressive already in the way he, uh, he stands. This morning, Russia launched a special military operation to protect the People's Republics of Donetsk and Luhansk. The main goals of the operation are to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine. 
now what Solovyov is doing here, he is once again repeating Putin's words. He announces the demilitarization and denazification of Ukraine. This is why uh, Slavyov is uh, paying so much attention to pronouncing these words, uh, to introducing them and imposing them on the audience. This is the point where he actually does Putin's job. Russia has never been a bastion of free speech, and now with the war, a single wrong word can land you in prison for up to 15 years. What well, was the first day of the war? Uh, the, the police, well, they, they assaulted me uh, and uh, I ended up uh, in a hospital with a concussion. Hundreds of thousands of people were trying to, to do their best for many, many years, struggling to avert uh, these, these course of events, whereas most of the Foreign countries' leaders were quite happy to uh, support uh, Vladimir Putin in his uh, repression against uh, against the Russians. So for me, just like for many Russian people, this is definitely not the first encounter with the police. When the territorial integrity of our country is under threat, we will use all means at our disposal to protect Russia and our people. This is not a bluff. First of all, of course, Putin is dressed officially and recalls Zelensky, who's uh, normally dressed unofficially. And this, there's always uh, communication between these two ways of uh, producing uh, images. Now, with Putin, you have close image uh, of him, which kind of creates even more power and even more aggression. He is literally in your room, and he will be threatening in, in this video. So he will be threatening from inside your room. Then Putin is ruler who has these phones, and with these phones, he's basically omnipotent. It takes a one phone call to get all uh, everything solved, and it also gets one phone call to get the nuclear weapons activated. And this is something Putin will be talking about. The collapse of the Soviet Union was a tragedy of the 20th century. We were one country and suddenly many were outside its borders. Putin's narrative, the idea of greater Russia, is also laden with myth. So he uses history as a weapon here. But what is notable about his narrative is that everything that stands in the way of this myth must be destroyed. In speeches and statements, Putin often alludes to the restoration of Russia's lost empire. People mm, would tend to overemphasize his experience in KGB, his formative experience in KGB. But his formative experience in, in St. Petersburg in the 90s was perhaps even more important. And Putin was a real gangster. Basically, the guy with the gun. would solve the issues with really scaring people, with, with fear, with violence. So that was an important lesson for, for him, but also for, for many Russians. While hordes of mercenaries are going to Ukraine, the president has abandoned it. This is what Ukrainian MP Ilya Kiva says on Telegram. He says Zelensky is already in Poland and hiding in the American embassy. I just got confirmation that the commander-in-chief of the Ukrainian armed forces, President Vladimir Zelensky, crossed the Ukrainian-Polish border today and took refuge in the U.S. Embassy. The leader of our parliamentary faction is here, the head of the president's office is here, Ukraine's Prime Minister Shmihal is here, Podolak is here, the president is here. 
We are all here. Our military is here. Our fellow citizens are here. We made this video on February 25th at the request of the president because he understood exactly and intuitively the mood of the country. We are all here defending our independence, our state. It will continue to be so. Glory to our men and women defenders. Glory to Ukraine. It was decided so that we wouldn't have to constantly refute the myths about our whereabouts to show where and who we are. On the president's initiative, I do believe it put an end to all the rumors. Mikhailo Podolyak has been part of the Zelensky team since 2020. His task to improve the president's relationship with the press. It's been said that he was the one who brought Arastovich on board in 2022. It's evening in Kyiv. Our office. It's Monday, evening. You know, we used to say, Monday is a hard day. There is a war in the country. In just a single clip, you can see what makes Zelensky such an effective communicator. He understands that this war is also a war of online images, and especially social media images. Using this video, I'll show you just how media savvy he is. This is the selfie Insta-Live aesthetic that's become his trademark. Compared to Putin's style of communication, you can see that he's speaking at eye level with the Ukrainian people. He sits down, takes us with him, and then comes the decisive cut. He sets aside the selfie perspective, here on the table, and he's now being filmed out of frame with a professional camera. So he starts with an Insta-Live aesthetic, and now he's shifted to the aesthetic of a presidential address. What's key here is that this cut symbolizes a shift in roles. He makes the shift from a soldier, who's reporting on events, to the president, who's addressing the people. The trick here is the speech has already started, so the cut looks more subtle than it actually is. It's it starts with the thought, in Ukraine we used to say, Monday is a hard day, cut, and finishes the thought after the cut with, there is a war in the country, so every day is Monday. There is a war in the country, so every day is Monday, and now we are used to the fact that every day and every night are like that. I started following the news on Telegram. I couldn't sleep. I called my father and asked, Dad, did you hear the explosion? Yes, I did. And I said, that's it. The war has started. We're leaving. The video went viral. After the first million hits, we were shocked. When it went viral, everyone told us that people cried, men and women, because it was so touching. Everyone remembered how they had experienced the 24th of February. News, explosions, problems and pressure were our constant companions. Tears. Tears. My telegram channels are always open. So many messages, it's hard. Viktor Anoshko is not alone on Telegram. It's the most popular messaging app in Ukraine. President Zelensky also used it during his election campaign, and now Telegram is used by Ukrainians to disseminate news of the war, warnings and appeals for support. And so is Instagram. 
I would like to address Dmitry Portnyagin. For three days you kept silent, you said nothing. Listen to me. You posted about Zelensky, about how shocked you are by him. That's nonsense. We began to actively take a stand on Instagram. I shared 20 posts about the war every day, especially since the mobilization. I also hope to reach my Russian audience. We defend ourselves, write what we feel. Are we supposed to stay silent? There's a panorama window over there. We can see when the neighbor turns on Arestovich. It's like a reminder. Let's turn it on too. Many friends also watch it. We watch Aristovich almost every evening. It's a tradition. Leon has to go to bed when the show comes on. Russian opposition activist Mark Fagan and Ukrainian military advisor Oleksiy Aristovich have a cult following. Their nightly YouTube talk show was launched when the war broke out. Weapons, weapons, weapons. Again, weapons. We need weapons, weapons. Once again, we need weapons. A lot of weapons. I think they will help us because without weapons, it will be very difficult. But if we get weapons when the weapons arrive, weapons are exactly what we need. Even before the war, Arestovich was well known in Ukraine. No matter how you feel about him, according to opinion polls, Arestovich is one of the three most popular people in Ukraine. So, does he now have ambitions to become president? Oleksiy himself, the master of predictions, won't venture to say. So let's see where his sharp tongue will lead him today. Aristovich was born in Georgia but grew up in Kyiv. He's had a colorful career from odd jobs as an actor to organizing seminars on psychology to training volunteer soldiers. Teach your subordinates never to be distracted when shooting in enemy territory. On YouTube, he tackles a variety of topics. Using a picture drawn by his son, he explains the psychological impact of war. I say, we don't fire on passenger planes. He replies, it's a military plane. But why do suitcases fall out after the missile hits? Because the military travels with suitcases. Child or adult, these images take root in our brain. Aristovich is very different in all the channels that he appears. He's an educator, he's a kind of a homeschooled philosopher, he speaks about literature, he speaks about politics, he speaks about uh, military action, he's about everything. An expert without expertise. Mr. Schultz, we're supporting the German budget here. So where, please, are our weapons? Aristovich posts his content on Telegram, where he has nearly 450,000 followers. He repeatedly finds himself at the center of scandals. But his fellow advisor, Mikhailo Podolyak, always defends him. When it comes to winning the communications war with Team Zelensky, minor disagreements don't come into play. Aristovich's talents as a social media influencer are why he was brought onto the presidential team. He often uses memes, photos embellished with images from popular movies or comics. A pop culture reference system takes the place of a historical reference system. Everyone gets it when they see Star Wars, the rebels versus Darth Vader. Here's the good guy, here's the bad guy. It's a reference system that transcends borders, at least for people who go online and get the pop culture references. They didn't even need to have seen the original. So now the younger generation is using this system of reference to make sense of a war that, at first glance, 
problems seems incredibly abstract and perplexing. That's led to this enormous mimification. Aristovich's reputation also rests on a frighteningly accurate prediction he made in 2019 regarding the separatist conflict in eastern Ukraine. If Ukraine moves to join NATO, could that be the end of the war in the East? No, we won't get a deadline to end the war. Instead, it might encourage Russia to launch a large-scale attack against Ukraine because they want to destroy our infrastructure and ruin Ukraine so that NATO loses interest. Would Russia seek direct confrontation with NATO? No, they have to do it before we join NATO. They won't want to take on a ruined country. I'm 99.9 percent .9 certain the price of applying to NATO is war with Russia. Arestievich is and remains a fool with a quiet voice. Besides, you're not a colonel, not even a lieutenant colonel. A military expert like you is like a bullet made of crap. Can you imagine the poor Ukrainian people spoon up this idiot's crap and believe him? Even with these lies, with everything they're spouting, nothing works out the way he says. But he tries to save face. You can see it on Solovyov's broadcasts on his crappy channel. It's characteristic of a fascist regime to claim the enemy is both weak and strong. When we look at Zelensky, Arestyevich, look at the faces of our boys and the ones from the other side. What beautiful boys we have, and what vicious, miserable freaks are over there. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has accused Russia of genocide after hundreds of bodies were discovered in the town of Bucha near the capital Kyiv. Images of mass graves and bodies showing signs of torture have sparked widespread international condemnation, with several EU countries now pushing for tougher sanctions against Russia. Moscow claims the killings were staged. Our next report contains some disturbing images. This is terrible footage from Bucha. Ukrainians were completely shocked by the sights and traces of genocide because these people were uh, killed, tortured, exterminated on the basis of their ethnicity because they were Ukrainian citizens. The war crimes in Bucha marked a turning point in the perception of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Not only did the cruelty of the Russian occupation become visible, for many Ukrainian reports and Russian disinformation collided directly for the first time. A few hours ago, I returned from the liberated territories of the Kyiv region, from what the occupiers left behind. Sorry, the video is hard to watch, but this is the reality. Go ahead. All the liberated cities look like something out of a post-apocalyptic horror movie. And among the victims of these war crimes by Russian forces are raped women who they tried to burn, local government workers who were killed, dead children, elderly people, men, many of their hands tied and show signs of torture. The awareness of this is, is something horrifying. And uh, in Ukraine, so many people cannot really uh, 
kind of sign off. And I always know that these several days I will be watching hundreds of videos of that. But it also contributes to uh, this cult of brute force in, uh, in Russia. And with this war, it becomes um, really, really impressive. Uh, so they believe that in the final account, all issues on this planet are settled through brute force. That becomes, you know, the cornerstone of, of, of this system. And that's why I think we're all in a big danger. Hundreds of people are ready to testify about the brutality of Ukrainian nationalists, said Russia's permanent UN representative Vasily Nabienzo today. I know you've seen bodies, heard stories, but you saw what they wanted you to see. Only total amateurs or our Western partners who stubbornly have been saying black is white and white is black would fall for this fake. You say it's all fabrication, what's happening in Butcher. It's all a fabrication? I said, I said, I said that these uh, this photographs appeared uh, only on the 3rd of April, while we left the place on the 30th of March. But, but the, the satellite evidence shows those bodies were there when you were in charge of that town. While analysing satellite imagery taken on the 19th of March, it's clear the bodies have been lying in the open for weeks, and critically, during the time Russian forces occupied the town. We've compared the satellite imagery and the Ukrainian soldiers' video. By highlighting bodies seen on the street, it's clear they're in the same locations in both the video and the satellite imagery. It's not true. Nothing today can be taken for granted, OK? And don't forget that the video that President Zelensky displayed today is a fake. Read my Twitter. This is why is it fake? Because it is a fake. It was... Uh, the people are not dead? The people are dead, but they were shot elsewhere where there were no Russian troops. It was it appeared before. Read the internet, read, read the users. So the rule is uh, deny it right to the end. Never admit anything. There will always be some funny people who will believe uh, you when, when you're denied. And then there is another layer. The denial joking about this. Any normal person knows if we'd done that, we'd have cleaned up after ourselves. Who of ours would have done that? No one. Everyone knows that. We're dealing with Nazis, with liars, scumbags who kill their fellow citizens without hesitation for the sake of a photo. Ukrainians are depicted as Nazis who stop at nothing, even suffering and death, to smear Russia in the eyes of the world. It's an effective form of wartime propaganda. The Russian people especially lap it up. They're only too happy to hear, this is all fake news. This is all American fakery, because it lines up with their own desire to deny these images. Ah, fake. Ah, fake. That's all I want to say. This is a fake. Butcher is clearly fake. It's the Ukrainians themselves doing this. It's a provocation, nothing more. It's a fake. The way the bodies are lying there, it's unnatural. It doesn't look real. Actually, the key word here is the word fake. But the most interesting thing about the word fake is that it doesn't exist in Russian. The vast majority of, of Russians never heard anything about fakes until very recently. So what comes from us is by definition truth, what comes from them is by definition a fake. Russian rocket hit uh, this area and uh, that's the huge crater behind me. The local people say that every day now they hear constant shellings, it's going on right now this moment here you can hear it happening at this exact moment Еще пострадавший есть! 
This is uh, Vova Viktorovich and Sasha Alexandra, <laughs> and they are the very brave crew of the car number 402. And uh, today we were uh, at a very difficult situation, and they actually saved my life. Maria Avdeva is a lawyer and political scientist. At the start of the war, she became a reporter. Her Twitter diary is part of the Ukrainian grassroots communication network. It's not orchestrated from above, but is her own creation. Hi there, this is Maria Avdeva from Kharkiv, Ukraine. I am standing in front of the main administrative building, which was hit by Russian rockets several days ago. Today but we still have Ukrainian... Hello, Hello. 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 this is Maria Avdeva. Hello. This is Maria Avdeva. This morning, Russian rocket hit. I ask you, please continue supporting Ukraine. We need your help. Only together we can win. 15th of March, Maria Avdeva, Kharkiv, Ukraine. This used to be a quiet neighborhood in the city center. That is what Putin calls denazification. Can you talk to us a little bit about what, what you've heard, what, what you've experienced? What is and the situation in Kharkiv? The, the city was uh, under uh, heavy bombardment for, for the two days. Uh, yesterday I had the possibility to go out uh, in the city center. The nearby residential houses are also heavily destroyed. They have no windows, fire is in some places. And here is the wall with the signs of Russian Great missiles hitting it, and it is very heavily destroyed. Many houses here, multi story buildings are completely in ruins. We are seeing a lot of um, material like this recordings, witnessing accounts of people immersed in the situation coming there in the most dangerous moment, sometimes right after the strike, to witness to account, to document, to make sure that there is a record of that. And they are quite uh, fearless in what they are doing. And so therefore, we have quite incredible archive of these records. How long have you been without gas? Gas? Two months. Since the war started. How often are you bombed? Every day. Every day. I feel like if I do this, I can help bring about justice. If you can at least establish what happened and who was responsible for it, it can make a difference. And perhaps it eases a bit of the pain of the people who have been directly affected by these crimes. It's important work. Полный контакт с Владимиром Соловьевым. Zelensky said something totally amazing during his performance. He is, of course, a rare fool. A Nazi pig posing as the Ukrainian president. So uh, what he is supposed to do here is to uh, explain why Zelensky is a Nazi. But what he does instead is actually repeating these uh, two words uh, along each other. 
Zelensky, Nazi, Zelensky, Nazi, 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 and therefore establishing an association between them, an emotionally laden association. It would arouse some uh, uh, very important emotions uh, in, in the audience. Typical Nazi, despicable, vile, malicious. But why? He says it's all the Russians' fault. It arouses resentment in the audience. And resentment is crucially an important feeling uh, to understand what, what Russians hear when they, uh, when they watch these, these shows. So they already feel victimized. They already feel victims of unjust aggression. It arouses anger and this uh, self-righteous feeling of being justified to conduct this, uh, this war. Volodymyr Zelensky, das ist und nazistischen Schweine! Happy New Year, dear friends. Our favorite holiday. Happy New Year, dear viewers. On this first New Year's Eve, we bring you Volodymyr Zelensky. The Russian spin doctor barely a decade ago. In 2013, Vladimir Solovyov celebrated New Year's Eve with Volodymyr Zelensky on Russian state television. And he was known for expressing pro-Ukrainian views. Let me put it this way. There will never be a war between Russia and Ukraine. Anyone who in all seriousness attempts such a thing is a criminal of unimaginable proportions. Ukraine's people are our brothers in spirit, in blood, in shared history. War with them would be the worst crime imaginable. You don't need to shout, Sevastopol is ours. You don't need to shout, Crimea is ours. We need to make life in our country so attractive that Ukrainians, Belarusians, Moldovans, Armenians, Georgians, all of them want to live with us in peace and come to us. Instead of saying, join us right now or I'll punch you in the face. Love me, love me, I said. Who would love someone like that? That's absurd. Less than eight years later, Vladimir Solovyov's opinions had shifted 180 degrees. By 2015, when a Dutch journalist interviewed Putin's propagandist, the annexation of Crimea was already a reality. Hello, Yella. Good to see you. You too. Russian or English? Let's uh, talk in English. It will be a bit, yeah. a bit easier. Take a grab, take a chair. So you're not scared to be right at the center of Russian propaganda no. machine? No. Okay. No. <laughs> Am I? Well, I don't know. You know, after I watched a whole bunch of programs, including the one about my show, I was a little bit surprised. Thought that the Cold War is over, but definitely not. Yeah. And had a weird feeling that the guys in the West, they have rather pervertic view mm -hmm. on what's happening in Russian media and Russia itself. Mm -hmm. What happens? What, in what way was it perverted? Uh, in the way that everyone thinks that, oh, you know, big Russian bear is back and the uh, Russians do eat poor Ukrainians for breakfast. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're all just uh, one call away from Kremlin. And mm -hmm. when it's needed, Putin just pick up the phone and get right into my ear and gives us ugly commands mm -hmm. to talk, to yeah. dance and other stuff. Yeah. Are there any themes that you censor yourself? You think, oh no, maybe now I go too far. Oh, well, why, why should word. I? You never have the feeling that, okay, maybe not do this because I run what into for? trouble. Of course not. You sure? And oh, every is helpful then. Every single program when we're discussing what's happening inside Russia, but it's not just Solovyov who has recast himself. Since Putin rose to power in 2000, the entire media system has gradually come under state control. In 2022, Reporters Without Borders ranked Russia 155th out of 180 on its World Press Freedom Index. The group also says that since the attack on Ukraine, there has effectively been no freedom of the press in Russia. I just spoke to a presenter for Russian state television. I should be a little afraid of him, or perhaps angry. 
like. But actually, I found him quite pleasant. No matter who I talk to and where they work, somehow I like all of them. I don't know if that's a good or bad quality. In Donbass, we again had dozens of civilian casualties. Near the village of Novo Selovo, unarmed civilians stopped a military convoy. Here they burn car tires to paralyze traffic. He bent down, asked for papers. The reply was a gunshot. Tatiana Ulyanova was a rookie Russian reporter when she was sent to Ukraine's eastern Donbass region in 2014 to report on the conflict. Even then, she felt misgivings about her job, but she came to terms with it. Because I'm blonde, they just thought it was a good photo op. Everything on fire behind me and me in the foreground, wearing a white dress, so to speak. It's been restless here since the morning. The army is on the streets, there's gunfire, people are forming a human shield. Moscow is quite an expensive city. You need money all the time. You can't do without a proper salary. I had a kind of agreement with my conscience that nothing bad was happening. I just told everyone, don't watch TV, just turn it off. So I had the feeling that I wasn't committing a crime. Let's start with the most important Western fake of this week. Russian Air Forces allegedly bombed a maternity clinic in Mariupol. The Russian embassy in London had the answer to that. They were fake. And the women in the pictures were merely actors. It's the indeed pregnant beauty blogger Mariana Podjeskaya. She actually played roles of both pregnant women on the photos. After Twitter took those tweets down, Russia's ambassador to the UN repeated the claim to the Security Council. It was clear that a hospital was bombed, and it was clear that many people were injured, and that it was the Russian side that did it. What's left to debate? The vast majority of the people in Russia understand what's going on there. If there was a maternity hospital bombed, if there were, there were these atrocities in Bucha, okay, these, might, these cases might be staged. But it is completely obvious, I mean, Russians are not idiots. It's completely obvious that these things are happening at this war, which means that Russian army is probably also involved in this war. This is the other way around. After that, it becomes absolutely clear that switching sides is no longer possible. We are all engaged in that now, and we have to deny it right to the end. Now there is no way back. They said, make a video preferably without people in the picture. My colleague and I tried that. I told him we need fewer people. And he said, what picture can I take? There's no picture without people. For Tatiana Ulyanova, spreading disinformation was a burden. She posted photos on social media of the destruction in Kharkiv and of a Ukrainian violinist playing in a bunker. Thursday morning, we woke up in another country. Our lives will never be the same again.
They called me and told me I was fired for extremist posts on social media. That was unacceptable. In the summer of 2022, she decided to leave the country with her husband and went to Barcelona. You're constantly forced to commit a crime. The worst thing is that many people rejoice in the fact that they're committing a crime. That's what horrified me the most in my work since the beginning of the war. Zelensky, a simple guy, someone like everyone else, someone who is using the media in the same way, maybe silly, maybe funny, uh, but someone who is regular. I think it comes also from his own uh, political platform which was, uh, in many respects, a populist platform. He was uh, trying to attack the, the Ukrainian establishment, and now he carries it over uh, to, to this war, this horizontal uh, style of communication. Unbreakable people of invincible Ukraine, free people of a free country, strong people of a country made of steel. President Zelensky is undoubtedly the top influencer in the world today, especially in the political sphere. Alexei, you see the president on a daily basis. How would you describe his behavior in these days and weeks? When I came here a year and a half ago and saw him at two meetings, my opinion of him changed. I thought he was weak, an actor who wasn't up to the job. Then he said, I'll pick up a machine gun and fight. I can say without flattery, he's in his element, he's a born leader. Ukraine's First Lady Olena Zelenska is also part of the communications juggernaut. She is communicating just like the president of Ukraine through many different channels to many different audiences, depicting herself as a regular woman, she is also, to a certain extent, the voice of, of many families, the voice of uh, people affected by this war, and I think she's doing it quite effectively. On her Instagram channel, Olena Zelenska posts glamour shots against the backdrop of war. The photo shoot with Olena Zelenska, I can see why it sparked a controversy. A woman in a fashion magazine with the war as her backdrop. That elicits dissonance and is perceived as performative, as a contradiction. But at the same time, the two of them have to use every means they can to raise awareness, to generate attention, to counteract the waning of empathy and attention which does happen when a war drags on. It's something that's been the subject of psychological research. It's called empathy fatigue. The Ukrainian media landscape also has its weaknesses. TV channels are owned by oligarchs and they wield influence over content. Reporters Without Borders has criticized the Ministry of Defense for withdrawing accreditation from journalists who filmed the liberation of the city of Kherson without official military authorization. Russia counted on capturing Ukraine within five days, but they had no idea who they were up against. Russia still had the capacity to attack and not only against Ukraine, 
Poland, Moldova, Romania and the Baltic states will become the next targets if the freedom of Ukraine falls. He has to apply pressure to protect his people. That's his job as president. And perhaps it's a message delivered out of desperation and necessity. And his steadfastness, his persistence, it's an expression of the fact that he still hasn't achieved his goal. Ukraine needs weapon supplies, artillery shells, 1.52 millimeters, as many as possible, multiple launch rocket systems. Grad, Smersh, Tornado or M142 HIMARS. Military aircrafts must have to deblock our cities and save millions of Ukrainians as well as millions of Europeans. Freedom must be armed better than tyranny. Western countries have everything to make it happen. I think the image of Zelensky and of the office is a little bit fetishized because who is really important today in this context is people, Ukrainian people. In the end, it's an extremely massive like, phenomena. It's very grassroots. Everyone, everyone in the country participates in this war. Glory to our brave armed forces, for Russia, for victory. Barely two months after invading its neighbor, Russia celebrated Victory Day with its annual military parade. The May 9th holiday commemorates the Soviet victory over Nazi Germany in World War II. The idea, of course, is once again the projection of, of force. The idea is that uh, the Victory Day, so it, it literally says, congratulate you with the Victory Day, it projects force. Victory means force. And oftentimes you will see in Russia those little stickers saying we can repeat that, meaning that we would like this to happen once again and we will take revenge, implying in a very weird way that we actually lost this war, so we are now in need of revenge. Let's switch to the Ukrainian one. Can spring be black and white? Is there eternal February? Are golden words devalued? Unfortunately, Ukraine knows the answers to all these questions. During their two years of occupation, the Nazis killed 10,000 civilians in Mariupol. In two months of occupation, Russia has killed 20,000. Decades after World War II, darkness has returned to Ukraine. Evil has returned. In a different form, using different slogans, but with the same goal. A bloody reconstruction of Nazism was staged in Ukraine, a fanatical repetition of this regime, its ideas, actions, words and symbols. So, obviously what we are seeing here is Zelensky uh, against the background of the destroyed buildings. And his main message is that should be never repeated. It should never happen again. Never again is the slogan. So the easiest way to summarize this contrast is uh, we can repeat in Russia versus never again in Ukraine regarding the same, the same holiday. And Zelensky is never tired of emphasizing this message because he doesn't want uh, this to happen in Ukraine. He doesn't want uh, Ukrainian army, for instance, uh, to be glorious in defeating Russians. He, this is not his message. He, he wants this to end. He wants this to be over. He doesn't want this, this to be repeated. So, meaning that the Ukrainian army is forced uh, now to do the things that Ukrainians wouldn't want to do. Uh, that war is unwelcome here. And this is, uh, of course, in stark contrast uh, to the Russian case, where war is very welcome. Ukrainian soldier Miroslav Velhan is on furlough, two days that the young married couple can spend together. 
On TikTok, Miroslav posts about his experiences in the war. He's one of many young Ukrainians who in spring 2022 turned the TikTok social media platform into war talk. Even now, on leave, he keeps returning to the images of war on his cell phone. I used to use TikTok for fun, posting pictures from boxing training, from matches, a few gags, things with girlfriends. When the war broke out, I started filming us on military vehicles and how we work. That's how it is. I think many actually sense this uh, disconnection between uh, the platform itself and the genre in which the TikTok videos are filmed with the content. And the content is horrific, the content is very adult, the content is scary. So part of its popularity is precisely to me has to do with this contradiction of discorrelation between <laughs> this platform and the content. <laughs> We met like this. A month of war had passed and I got bored. I registered on Badu. Three days later, she wrote to me. We met on March 21st. On the 22nd, he said, you're going to be my wife. I'm going to have a son at 19 and I want five kids. Everything all at once, but we had never seen each other, not even on FaceTime. <laughs> We had only talked on the phone a few times. I might be home for two or three days, or not for two months. There's this too. It's very hard. When the war came, I thought, if I die, so be it. I didn't want to live anymore, to die of old age. I wanted a hero's death. We post photos from training all the time, but rarely from the battlefield. At most, after we've left. While we're still there fighting, we don't post anything, as if we weren't there at all. They pay a visit to Miroslav's parents. I think about it all the time. My son and I send each other a smiley in the morning. That means we're all right. The same in the evening. That means we're still alive. Many political observers refer to this war as the TikTok war because it's the first European war to take place in the era of social media, especially on TikTok. Young Ukrainians use TikTok to offer glimpses of their everyday lives during wartime. But they also use it to communicate and, of course, to process this war, the pain and fear that they obviously feel. What's also interesting is that the TikTokization of this war has made it instantly available to a global audience. We have war diaries now that aren't just made available to us after the fact. They're available in real time. War diaries with daily entries that express what young people are feeling and experiencing in this war. I'm 
Valeria Shashinok, a TikToker who used to be a classic influencer with some travel blogging, the classic TikTok aesthetic. Her TikTok channel Valerish has about 25 million views for her war videos. She's made many videos that have gone viral. What's interesting is how users intuitively employ narrative structures, so with protagonists, antagonists, ruptures, punchlines and surprises. And here we have the antagonist Putin, what he intends to do with Ukraine. First image, destroy house by bombs. And this smiley, which I think is fundamental, illustrates the kind of ironic defiance that young Ukrainians are adopting. They have no other way to respond to this war, which is as absurd as it is incomprehensible to them, than with irony or sarcasm. Second example, what is life like in a bunker, in an air raid shelter? Valerie shows the public what this war is like. And that's relevant on a global level because it can also explain the dynamic of solidarity, the online solidarity that has developed quite well. You can't help but have compassion and empathy for these young people and also recognize the injustice that is being inflicted on them. We are the multinational people of the Russian Federation, united by a common destiny. Even Putin's more traditional brand of propaganda is looking for new outlets. Ksenia Klochkova is a journalist who researched the phenomenon of paid internet trolls for the online newspaper Fontanka. Cyberfront Z is a movement whose members identify themselves as information warriors. She applied to join Putin's cyber troops and spent a day there undercover. Good evening. We're looking for people in St. Petersburg. What's the salary? Is there an interview? Salary is 45,000 rubles a month. There is an interview. For example, under the live stream of Putin's speech at the Luzhniki Stadium, you had to leave hearts in the form of the letter Z and the color of the Russian flag. For the glory of Russia, that's how it was then. That's how it is today and how it will remain. Thank you. I followed how things were developing at Cyberfront. And then I saw an ad online for a discussion club. I was curious about what was happening there, too. The regular discussion events are designed to give the impression of an amateur political debate club. The guests are surprisingly international. Some even come from Western Europe. Putin's youth movement is rising to the challenge. My name is Dmitry Nikolaevich Mahayev. I'm the moderator of the Cyberfront Z platform. I'm also a member of the Extended Expert Council on Culture in the Youth Parliament of the State Duma. I can see who's steering the Ukrainian state and where they want to take it. They are deliberately breeding Nazis with only one thing in mind, to kill Russia, to kill Russians. We had to respond. After the start of the special operation, Western intelligence agencies launched a huge, fierce information attack on us. So we as citizens were forced to organize ourselves. First, we launched the telegram channel Cyberfront Z, which launched the fight against disinformation.
The success of Ukrainian online grassroots messaging is apparently forcing the Kremlin to follow suit. Cyberfront Z styles itself as a network of volunteers. It's the latest division of Putin's troll army, which first made the news in 2003. These young Russians get paid to attack anyone who criticizes the Kremlin online. Let's put it this way, we get help. The space here has been provided for us by generous comrades, patriots who are not looking for profit and even invest their own money. Just as I invest my money as a volunteer, which I earn from the revival of the Russian tea tradition. Yevgeny Prigozhin is known as Putin's chef. The Russian oligarch is said to have launched Russia's first troll factory. One of the clues is that it all takes place in a bar that belongs to Concord, which has direct ties to Yevgeny Prigozhin. He himself has also made a statement about Cyberfront Z through his press office. He says they're good guys. But he never admits any connection with such organizations. That's how it is with Cyberfront Z, which some call Troll Factory 2.0. The cyber war forces weren't as dominant as expected. There was a fear that the bots would come and clog up all the channels with misinformation, fake news and deepfakes. That a huge number of videos would crop up that were completely fake. But the few videos that actually did appear were debunked fairly quickly. And they were quickly counted with a mass of counter videos as a corrective. In April 2022, a task force stormed the apartment of alleged would-be assassins from Ukraine. Their supposed target was Vladimir Solovyov. The Federal Security Service has stopped the activities of a terrorist group that planned to attack and murder a famous Russian TV journalist. Inside that apartment, where we observe the capture of uh, a man, we also see a fantastic collection of props that explain who that alleged Nazi is. Whose murder was being planned? The murder of people who spread propaganda. So Solovyov, Kiselyov, Skabieva, Popov, and so forth. Once again, Vladimir Solovyov played a key role in Russia's propaganda machine, this time as the ostensible victim of an assassination attempt made public by Putin himself. The performance was designed to lend credence to the claim that Ukraine is controlled by Nazis. And the weapon. And the skull. So this complete picture also is set to persuade. So nobody has any doubts that these are Nazis and they wanted to kill uh, Solovyov. Yes, Solovyov, apparently there was an attempt to either rape or kill him. I didn't quite understand. Solovyov, hmm. If we had the opportunity to take out a target in Moscow, it probably wouldn't be Solovyov. Obviously. As far as I know, everyone who works in the media thinks that Solovyov's a joke. That's for sure. I'm not surprised. It's in line with Nazi logic to murder Jewish journalists. 
That's how the followers of the Ukrainian collaborator Bandera operated. Everybody knows that everybody lies. And basically this is the main message that uh, Putin's propaganda has been delivering over those 22 years. Everybody lies, including us, of course. Of course we, we were lying to you. Everybody lies to everyone. This is how humans uh, uh, communicate with each other. Autocrats who lie pose the same dilemma. We need to challenge those lies and do a proper fact check. But people were more skeptical about the fact checks than about the lies themselves. This week, former Georgian security minister Igor Georgatsa posted classified records online about the development of biological and chemical weapons in U.S. laboratories near the Russian border. The story of secret weapons labs in Ukraine is not new. In 2018, Tatyana Ulyanova produced an entire documentary on the subject for Russian television. By then I was quite experienced. I was working as a news editor, mainly on international stories. Then we were told to do a report on secret biological laboratories. While the fabled Novichok is being hunted down in Britain, Americans have set up a secret laboratory network to develop bioweapons. They may already be testing them on our territory. An investigation by Esvestia exclusively for REN-TV. Russia has a long history of lying about biological weapons, going all the way back to the Soviet era. The claim that Ukraine maintained secret bioweapons laboratories was little more than disinformation, intended to justify invading a neighboring country. It's no secret that all the station heads go to the Kremlin on Thursdays for a briefing. After that, some guy comes in, throws something on your desk, all you see is, wow, we've uncovered secret labs. Then you go film some crazy idiots telling you some sort of rubbish and you've got a sensational investigation in your pocket. The forbidden experiments are only a small part of the revelations from former Georgian security minister Igor Georgatsa. One of the key ideas uh, about those kind of alleged threats generated and manufactured in the biolabs where that it has to do something with uh, ethnicity, right? So somehow it's only against Russians. So somehow it targets precisely. So it's a kind of uh, taps into particular vulnerability or fear uh, about this myth of produced viruses. The Pentagon focused on Ukraine, where there is a network of biocenters. The U.S. has invested nearly $200 million. I asked all sorts of experts for a comment. In Moscow, they all turned me down. They said I'd gone crazy. What are you talking about, young lady? Mosquitoes as bioweapons and secret laboratories? We confirm the facts uncovered during the special military operation in Ukraine. They show that the Kyiv regime is getting rid of any trace of military biological programs conducted with U.S. funding. I began to realize it wasn't a joke. We produced terrible things that got stuck in people's heads, and then they believed it. So for initial kind of production of fear and worries and noise, that was pretty effective to destabilize our audiences. Uh, perhaps they were other reasons and we could notice it, but I think this destabilization and creation of worry was probably the major effect of uh, that particular fake.
the surrender of the Azov Regiment in Mariupol was a goldmine for Russian propagandists. Founded in 2014, Azov was a volunteer militia with ties to the far right, which Russia used to bolster its claim that it was engaged in a fight against Nazis. But according to the scientific services of the Bundestag, an impartial organization that serves as a kind of fact-checker for the German parliament, this is reality-distorting propaganda. Two and a half thousand chosen, we'll show you now. Chosen pretzels. I don't want to swear. SS dogs. Nazi scum. I don't want to swear. They surrendered yesterday. They hid like rats. Donbass has the right to seek the trial of Nazi criminals. Tribunal. Только tribunal. They want to give Putin a gift, and the best gift for a ruler is the head of his enemy. They really want to, but let's see if they can. The Azov Battalion is just one of many battalions, regiments of the Ukrainian army. It's a non-ideological, regular army unit. It had some convoluted history, but at this moment it functions completely as a non-ideological group. In 60 minutes, the headlines. Hello, dear friends, comrades. At the Azov steel plant in Mariupol, the neo-Nazis are being loaded onto a bus with the letter Z on it. The wounded will be taken to Nova Azovsk Hospital. The rest are being taken to a prison camp in Yelenovka near Donetsk, where, according to U.S. propagandists like CNN, they will be arbitrarily tortured and killed, every one of them. Even though Skabeva, the anchor, is assumedly debunking these accusations, but the hidden message uh, to the very heated and militarized audience is that, of course, they will be tortured and killed. And uh, that's actually something we cannot tell you directly, but we hope that it will happen. And we assure you that we will do anything possible for it to happen. So it kind of works on two levels. What? Here is the notorious pre-trial detention center Yelenovka, and here are the prisoners. They were given medical care, one even had surgery. They get warm clothes, regular meals. On one level, it denies the fact, but on a different level, it admits this fact. And it's also a very nihilistic technique, because uh, the idea, of course, is that it is fine to torture and kill people. You just need to deny it uh, all the time. And so you should be doing both. Uh, because if you deny it in a different manner, and normally, I mean, if you are denying something, you wouldn't do it in this way. You would do it in a different way, like uh, trying to, to demonstrate how, how different our attitude to these people is, uh, why we are not inclined to, to do that to them. So this is not the normal way for a human being to deny something. But this dehumanization and demonization extends to the whole Ukrainian population. Because at first, the Russian state media spoke about that particular battalion being a group of Nazi. And now Ukrainian means Nazi. That is the recent Russian tactics of terrorizing and intimidating civilian population of Kharkiv because there was no air siren, no alert. I have been to the liberated uh, village Krakowa, which is on the way from Kharkiv to Izum, about 70 kilometers. It was under Russian occupation for more than six months, and uh, it is heavily mined, and the people there are clearly traumatized because what happened uh, when the uh, invasion uh, started and the, when this village was occupied. This is uh, a location in recently liberated Izum, uh, where Russian troops were stationed. In her role as a journalist, Maria Avdeva reports on the impact of the Russian occupation. In so doing, she becomes an eyewitness to Russian terror. 
Her reports on the torture and murder of Ukrainian civilians support the Ukrainian narrative as a modern-day fight of David versus Goliath. Reports such as these increase pressure on the West to continue supplying Ukraine with weapons. As a grassroots reporter, Avdeva is determined to shed light on the reality of the Russian occupation. Barbarians. They took me to the edge of the village, saying, you're going to dig yourself a grave now. They scared me. More mass graves were found near Izium. The terror uncovered by Maria Avdeva also serves a purpose for Russia. The brutal violence is a tool, a form of propaganda that tells Ukrainians in no uncertain terms what will happen to them if they don't comply. Among the many types of propaganda, this is one of the most terrible. The Second World War left its mark on those who lived through it. And their trauma has been passed down to later generations. What people went through here will also reverberate across the generations. For now, any hope of healing from the trauma is a distant prospect. In Ukraine, media and communication are still in wartime mode. Unlike Russia, it does not rely on deliberate disinformation. But while Ukraine does not spread deliberate falsehoods, information is often provided selectively or not at all. For example, Ukraine only rarely releases figures on military casualties, and then only when it appears to be strategically useful. Speculation about where the war is headed is everywhere. I'll tell you what's coming, and this time it's not a sad prediction. These idiots who have no idea how to fight will continue hastening the collapse of the Russian army and society, and one day it will break their backs, probably in February or March. So in principle, everything will be fine. On January the 14th, 2023, a Russian missile hit a residential building in the city of Dnipro. More than 40 people were killed. Oleksiy Arastovich claimed that the missile had fallen on the building after it was shot down by the Ukrainian air defense. Though that was soon refuted, Russian propagandists seized on this statement to blame Ukraine. Arastovich's remark provoked widespread criticism at home. Three days later, he announced his resignation as presidential advisor. Meanwhile, Putin's mouthpiece is pulling out all the stops. At an event for Russia's young elite, Vladimir Solovyov exhorted them to be ready to go to war. Will we win? Who needs a world without Russia in it? That's what our president said. So the world has two options. The first is that we win. They won't like the second one. Now is the time when you should be getting ready. Because before you know it, you'll have to take real responsibility in response to what now might seem like fun and games and stand side by side with our heroes when you're old enough. Ukraine and Russia, a war that is also being waged on the digital battlefield, a propaganda war that both countries are determined to win.